We are excited to have with us Pastor Nate Pickowitz from all the way over in New Hampshire. Thanks for joining us, Nate. Absolutely. Happy to be here. Oh, thank you. Nate, I don't know how many books you have to have written before you get labelled prolific, but you must be edging that way. I I don't know either. Uh, so I've written uh, I've written five books uh, myself, start to finish, and then I've edited probably six or seven books uh, in the last five or six years. So uh, I've I've done a lot of work, but in terms of actually writing, this is I've done five. The one we're talking about today is number four. So yeah. And hot off a press, I I saw that you mentioned on Twitter yesterday that you're actually working on another couple of ideas at the moment. Right? What are they? Yeah, so I've signed with Christian Focus, which is up near where you are, uh, to do a, 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 re a revision of an earlier book I wrote called Why We're Protestant, about the five solas. So I've been doing an expanded version of that. And then I'm contracted to write another book uh, on um, uh, early Christian creeds. Um, so I'm going to do a book on, on creeds, uh, just a very introductory for the layperson, just to help get people sort of into creedalism and, and confessionalism. Uh, I'm not, uh, we'll, we'll talk about this another time, I'm sure, but I'm, I'm new to it as well. So I'm trying to write a, just a helpful primer to get people moving in the right direction. So that'll be hopefully coming out in the next year or two. We'll see what happens. Then we'll look forward to that. But before you share lots of tips and advice on how to read the Bible that are drawn out of your, your fourth book, How to Eat Your Bible, tell us a bit about yourself, Nate. Sure. I'm a pastor in uh, New Hampshire, which is in the, in the States. Uh, born and raised in the town that I'm in. The name of my town is Gilmanton Iron Works. It's a long title for a, a town, but uh, born and raised here and then met my wife, Jessica. We've been married 16 years. We have three children, uh, ages 11, eight, and one and a half, uh, which was interesting. Uh, and then uh, we planted the church that we're in, Harvest Bible Church, uh, in 2013. So we're coming up on 10 years in January, uh, a church plant that's, uh, that's now... Uh, just moving along and growing by God's grace. Um, and then in the midst of all of that, doing ministry locally, the Lord has allowed me uh, to write as well. So I enjoy uh, writing. Uh, I've preached around a little bit, but I, I enjoy writing a lot more. So uh, as we've talked about, just uh, an opportunity to, to teach the church and give people resources that are helpful and try to encourage people in the right ways. And so that's just an outpouring of the local ministry. So um, and then in terms of hobbies, people ask me about hobbies. I have no hobbies. I don't have time for hobbies. So yeah. no, too busy for, for hobbies. So, yeah. A lot of people might recognize your voice with a voiceover on American gospel. You gave a really helpful, clear explanation of what the gospel is. How did you get involved with that project? Yeah. So that was, uh, that was interesting because the, the director, uh, Brandon Kimber, uh, who I had not met prior to, he reached out to me after I did Why We're Protestant, which is, again, a book on the solos and uh, an apologetic for Protestantism versus Roman Catholicism. So apparently he read the book and contacted me and said, hey, I'd like you to consider being in my movie. Well, I went home and I told my wife, I said, some guy wants me to be in his movie. And she goes, oh, don't do that. You know, and I'm like, yeah, I don't know. So he sent me a trailer and I looked at the trailer and it was really well done. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, so I, I looked him up and realized that he'd actually won awards and had done a lot of other work and was was actually a very prominent and uh, and, and uh, talented writer and director. And so once I realized he was going to do that level of quality for the gospel, I said, well, absolutely. So I contacted him and I then I begged him to take me at that point. Um, but then uh, <laughs> had a chance. So I was at G3 uh, conference in uh, 2018, early 2018. And so we were able to connect and I sat down for only about an hour and just answered questions and just talked. And then I kind of forgot about the project. And then like a year later, the movie came out. And so it's funny because even now people will, will come to my church or they'll see me and they'll say, oh, I remember you from American Gospel. Mm -hmm. And I have to pause yeah. because I'm not I don't think about that. I think about my preaching ministry or my writing ministry and I forget sometimes about the movie. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think most people when they see me, they'll see my face and they, they don't know who I am. But then they'll say, they'll see uh, Gilmanton Ironworks, New Hampshire. And most people have said, I didn't realize there was a church in, in that part of New Hampshire. So I think that's the bigger draw is that there's a, there's a pastor and a church and a gospel witness in our small town. So uh, tremendous blessing to be a part of it. So thankful that it's doing things for the kingdom and that people are hearing the gospel and actually becoming saved by watching that movie, which is 
just such a great joy. And the fact that I get to be part of that is just tremendous. So, yeah, great. You open up your book with a, an honest retelling of a story about when you worked for a Christian employer. He asked you some direct questions in here about your walk with the Lord. Take us back there, Nate, so that we can get a, a sense of where you were and how you began to bridge your need for being in the word. Yeah. So before I was a pastor, I was in business. I, I worked for a financial services company. I was uh, I did investments and insurance and things like that. So I, I fancied myself a businessman. And that was that was my goal was to go and be in business forever and make lots of money and do lots of things and all that stuff. But I was at a point in business where uh, I, I was a Christian, newly a Christian, going to church and doing all the things I was supposed to be doing in church. But my relationship with God was really struggling. And, and it was starting to bleed into certainly my work, but also my marriage. Um, I don't think I had kids at the time. I didn't have any kids at the time. It was just my marriage at that point. Um, but just really, you know, I really didn't feel like I knew God. I, I knew about God and I knew a little bit of scripture, but I just really was disconnected. And I, my communion with God was not good. And so uh, I remember very vividly sitting at my desk and just frustrated. I mean, if when you're in sales, everything's frustrating, you know, but I remember that, that specific day, just really feeling like, you know, my, my business was failing. Um, but it was, there was more going on than just that, you know, my life was felt like it was failing. And, um, and I just was, I pulled the Bible off my, I kept the Bible on my shelf. I pulled it off. I flipped it open. And I just remember saying, Lord, I, I don't know what you want. I don't know who you are. I don't, I don't know. I said, I just, please help me. And I, it was desperation. I just was asking for help. And I flipped around. I couldn't, I was looking for some magical verse that was going to do the trick for me. And I couldn't find that, you know. And so when I flipped to the front, there was, it was a study Bible. I flipped to the front and there was a whole section on how to read the Bible. And I, no one had ever really explained that to me before. And so as I worked through that, it sort of piqued my interest and I began to, I was following a, a Bible reading plan and I began to just read the Bible systematically, you know, day by day, verse by verse, and then praying as I went. Um, and so that, that moment really changed everything. And it started me on a path over the next seven and eight years where I began to study more intentionally and in a different way. And really that became not just the, the beginning of my journey to know God better in my Christian walk. But I think that also became the, 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 the fertile soil of the Lord calling me into ministry. You know, pastors who don't know the Bible, you can get seminary degrees and that's great. And you can study theology and that's wonderful. But if you don't have a baseline of the Bible, you can't do ministry. You, you don't have any tools. You don't have any authority of nothing. Um, so God used all of that period of time, that very low period of time, uh, to do a mighty work in my heart and change me and, and force me to realize I was dependent on him and on his word. And so, yeah, that moment really changed me forever. Yeah. One of the greatest threats facing Christianity is Christians who do not know the word of God. What, what have you observed about the current spiritual climate in the Western world? And why are people struggling to read the Bible consistently? Yeah, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, when I wrote How to Eat Your Bible, I, I tried to explore some of those, but really it's, it's multifaceted. Uh, I think there's a lot of problems. I think part of it is that we're, we're too blessed as the Western culture is way too blessed. And I, I, I shudder to say that, but, you know, we, we have, you know, we have, we have 20 copies of this book in our house. We have it on our phone. We have just ample access to the word of God. But yet we're so blessed that, you know, we're just we're addicted to distraction and we we're, we rather focus on everything else in the world except the scriptures. Um, and so I think part of it is that just a low spiritual condition, not revering the word of God. Uh, we've we've allowed too much, not just technology, but too much media, too many uh, worldly philosophies to come in. Uh, we, we just have allowed ourselves to, to become um, lazy, spiritually lazy. And I think that is at an impact. And when you go into a, a culture, I mean, you think about what's happening in China right now, you know, very oppressive government, but a thriving church. And when they smuggle Bibles in and people, believers get the word of God, sometimes for the first time, there's just a, a delight and a love. And I remember hearing the story of a pastor friend of mine who talked to a, a, a missionary or a believer from, from China. 
And she asked him, she said, Pastor, um, you know, how many times a year do you read to the Bible? And he went, well, what do you mean how many times a year, you know? And he felt kind of embarrassed in the moment, uh, maybe only once a year. Uh, I know most believers probably that. But I mean, for them, they're just immersed in the word of God because they recognize that they need it. So that's a long answer to a short question, but it's a complicated question. I think there's a spiritual lethargy. I think there's an overabundance and overblessing. I just don't think believers know, uh, they don't know what they need. And I think culturally, Christian culture, we're so caught up in emotionalism and feelings and pragmatism uh, that we're very easy to dispense from the word because I want to get something from God directly. But he's already revealed to us in the scriptures everything that we need for life and godliness. And I think many people are just ignorant to what the Bible actually says. So again, lots of reasons, I think, for it. But I think that we're on the cusp of, a, of somewhat of a, an awakening to Scripture. And I think, I think right now in this current climate, um, I think there are more believers that, are, that realize they're starving for the Word and now want the Word. And I think what's happening post-COVID, I think our churches are starting to reflect that. Bible churches are, are increasing and growing, and people are hungry for truth because they recognize that there's been a famine in the word of, in the land for the word of God, and they, they're hungry and they want the scriptures. So I praise God for that, and I, I hope and I pray that a book like mine is going to help people to at least have an appetite for this and, and have some tips and some guidance on how to get into the scriptures. So, yeah. yeah. Discipleship has become a forgotten art in many churches today, Nate, hasn't it? Evangelism can often stop at the point of getting someone into the church building, but we know that just isn't right. What does true biblical discipleship look like? Yeah, I mean, the thing with discipleship is that we're, we're called to do it. So when Jesus tells the disciples in, in Matthew chapter 28 to go into the, all the world and make disciples of all nations, and he says, baptize in them. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and then teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So discipleship is really, all it is, is, is bringing somebody else along with you and teaching them how to be a student of the Lord and thereby of the word. So we're teaching people to be students and learners of God. Um, so that's all that really is. And, and we're called to do it. How we do it, I think, is really, there, there's a lot of flexibility there. We do see a model in, Acts, uh, in uh, Titus chapter 2 where we see uh, older men and older women working alongside younger men and younger women. And that's a, a model, I think, for us because uh, we need each other. You know, it's not just the super spiritual people working with everybody else. It's all of the church, all of the members of the body coming alongside somebody else. And so I usually try to tell people in our church, and, and we're still figuring all this stuff out as a church as well. I think every church grows in this area. But trying to help people form natural personal connections with other believers and then walk with them. It's one thing to teach, you know, just in the classroom setting, which I do. Um, but there's something very different to helping other believers live a life that is according to the word of God. So how they live, do work at their jobs, there's biblical instruction for that. How they have uh, marriages, there's instruction for that. How to raise children, there's Bible verses for that. So all elements of a Christian life, the word of God is, is to be brought to bear on all of the, the Christian life. And we need faithful saints to go before us who can model for us and teach us and help us. And so I think uh, fellowship in the body and relationships building in the body is the best way to, to foster discipleship, but it has to be intentional. You have to actually call somebody on the phone and say, hey, let's talk about how you're doing uh, and that's hard. I mean, it takes a lot of work, but I think uh, that's a lot of what we see in the scriptures is, is life on life, to borrow a, a, an overused phrase. But that's really what it is, is people engaged in each other's lives to help them. Yeah. When someone approaches the Bible for the first time, it can seem daunting and intimidating. Nate, if you had to explain the storyline of a Bible for someone that has never read it before, how would you do that? Yeah, so there's a lot of ways to do that because there is there is an overarching story. Um, I've I've heard it this way that um, that the Old Testament is really the, the biography of God, uh, that we get to understand who God is, what He's done, that He's created everything in the world, that He's created people, that He has a will that's been given to people, that He has worked in and through uh, through covenants and through promise and through 
miraculous works and through providence. He's worked in the, the lives of people. But then because of, uh, because of sin and the fall and, and a rebellion against God, he also, and amongst these people, uh, has provided salvation for them. Uh, he does provide sometimes physical salvation when needed, but the primary need is, is um, a spiritual salvation and an eternal salvation. And that's when we see Christ coming in the New Testament to redeem and to save people who've been lost. So it's this whole story arc of God creating the world that's good, seeing it fall into rebellion, uh, working through the sinful nature, preparing the way for a salvation, a Messiah to come, a, a Savior to come, and then him saving people, the church being born, and then the end of the Bible is the consummation, the end of the story. So it's a one big long story arc, all of God working and laboring and blessing uh, to save his people. Uh, and so that's really what the, the Bible's about. It's about God rescuing his people and preserving them all for his own glory. Yeah. This book or collection of books was written by many different human authors, inspired and directed by God across thousands of years. What are some golden rules that we need to remember when we read and apply the Bible to ourselves in our generation today? Yeah, I think one of the challenges that people have is that when they approach the Bible, um, it's daunting, you know, and, and I think you look and there's, there's, you know, there's poetry and there's literature and there's history and then there's allegory and there's prophecy and it can be a little bit confusing. So I think one of the key rules is when you're reading and studying that you have to remember that all of this was written in a context. I think the, the word context is so important for, for students of the Bible, really students of any book of literature, uh, is to understand context. You know, what was God saying in, in this specific instance to those specific people? Um, and we have to put ourselves into, as R.C. Sproul used to say, he'd say, find the drama. You know, find what's going on in the passage and put yourself in there and see what's going on with, with those people in that time. So if we understand that God is writing and giving instruction and giving revelation in a context, we have to do the work of figuring out what that context is. And then once we've done that, once we have understood the context of what's actually happening, then we can make application. We can understand and, and build doctrine, build teaching around that and say, what is God saying about this issue? What does God say in Genesis 1 and 2 about life, about marriage, about family? What is the overarching principle, the teaching? That's doctrine. So once we understand what's going on, what the Bible actually says, we can understand what it means. And then we can see, once we have understand the truth that's coming off the page there, then we can say, okay, now how do I apply this? How do I use this in my own life? Because I can't take you know, specific verses and specific promises and say, oh, those are written directly to me, because they might not have been written directly to me, but I can draw truth from that. I can apply what's being written for us. And the Bible is very clear that all the scripture is profitable for us. So we just have to do the work of understanding uh, what God intends for us to know and what he intends for us to do. So again, very basic uh, principles of Bible interpretation and application. Um, but the Bible is, even though it's a remarkable book, it's a, it's a fantastic book, uh, an amazing, miraculous book. It's also, on some level, very simple. And even children can read it and understand some truth in there. And so I think uh, for the person who's struggling uh, to be encouraged uh, that the Bible can be understood, it can be known, yet you'll spend the rest of your life delving through the deep mysteries of scripture. Yeah. Hope that's helpful. Yeah, it is for sure. You just touched on this slightly, but what are some of the common mistakes that people can make when reading the Bible? I think one of the biggest ones, so there's, there's two, two buzzwords that we can use. Uh, one is called exegesis and one is called eisegesis and they sound similar, but the idea of exegesis, exa, pulling something out of, when you read the Bible, you don't want to go in with your presuppositions. You don't want to go in with, well, I think the Bible is going to say this to me and, and read yourself and your own thoughts into the text. That You can't do that on any book. That's not fair. Um, that's called um, eisegesis, putting something onto the text. Exegesis is drawing out of the text. And I think people, um, the, the, the tendency is to say, well, this verse means this to me, and they make it about themselves. An honest student of scripture, an honest believer will go to the Bible and say, Lord, what do you have to say to me? What are you saying? What do you mean? What do you care about? 
Um, and so drawing the, the truth and the principles and the application from the Bible, that's what we have to do. But I, I think sometimes people will, they'll read their own thoughts into it. Uh, they'll over-spiritualize. They'll make something bigger from the text than it actually is um, and, and try to sort of see hidden meanings and hidden codes and hidden things that really the Bible doesn't give any warrant to. Um, God has enough to say in the scriptures, and I think we just have to work hard to understand what he actually is saying, because what he is saying uh, is remarkable and life-changing. So uh, don't stick yourself in there. You want to draw out what is God saying? What, is, what does he really want me to know? That's what's important. Yeah. Why is application so important, Nate? Why is the, the Bible like no other book where we can just read it, absorb the information, and then just carry on as we were before? Yeah, well, Hebrews 4.12, uh, there's a verse that says the word of God is living and active. Well, living and active. Well, how, how do words and, and ink and pages, how does that come alive? Well, uh, we understand that the word of God uh, is not just what's on the page, but it's a living word. It's, it's something that is alive in real time. So what God says in history past is what he has, is saying right now because God himself is timeless and everything he has to say is, is living and applicable right now. And what ends up happening is when a person becomes a Christian, the spirit of God indwells that person, regenerates their heart. They become a new creation. And then they begin to think and respond to God because he's working in them through the spirit. So what happens is that when we read the Bible, these are the timeless words of God. Then, then the spirit of God will work with us. It's it's very remarkable, but the God, the, the Lord of, of heaven and earth will work through the scriptures and brings them alive to us. And so, um, you know, it's not that what we, we read them, they become the word of God or they become alive. They're already the word of God. They're already alive, but then they get applied to us. And when you, when you read the text of scripture, you can hear the voice of God speaking to your conscience because the spirit is using that word. It's different than any other book. Any other book is just information on a page that has a voice, it has meaning, it has application, but the Spirit of God uses the Word, and the Word is alive, and there's nothing like it. It cuts to your heart, it can divide the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, I mean, it can go right to the core of who you are, it diagnoses you, uh, it, it comforts you, it convicts you, it corrects you, it does so much to change you from the inside out and give you the mind of Christ. And it's really quite, quite remarkable. I know I keep on using that word, but I don't know what else to say about the word is that it's remarkable. Um, so yeah, that's, there, there's something huge about the words of scripture. Uh, it's unlike anything else in the world, really. How important is prayer when we read the Bible and what sort of things should we be praying for? Yeah, that goes right in line with, um, with the indwelling of the spirit, the ministry of the spirit. Again, you know, we can read the book, the Word of God, the Bible as an academic exercise. We can study out the text and the grammar and the history, and, and people do that all the time, and I think we should do that. But there's a spiritual component there, and if we understand that illumination, making sense and having the lights come on in our minds and in our hearts, if, that, if illumination comes from God, then we have to ask Him to help us understand, because there are deep, hidden things that are in the Bible that are not immediately discernible to person who doesn't have a, a regenerate born again mind. Um, unbelievers who read the Bible don't understand a lot of the things that are going on in there. It's not because they're, they're ignorant or they don't have sense, but they don't have the mind of Christ. They don't have the spirit of God living in them. And so it's, I've even, I read old history books and Puritans and things like that. And when you read a lot of the modern atheistic scholars trying to understand the simple doctrines that the Puritans are writing about, they, they get them wrong all the time, not because they're not smart, but because they don't have the mind of Christ. What does that all mean? That all means that the Bible and the things of God are spiritual things. These are, these are spiritually discerned, as 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says. So if that's the truth, and if, if God speaks to us through the word and gives us understanding, then we have to go to him and say, Lord, I need your help. That's what I did on that day when I realized that was a mess. I just cried out to God. If you don't, I, my prayer was simply this. If you don't help me understand, I will not understand. And I need you. I need to know. Uh, I need to know you. I need to know your word. And so God was faithful to help me and give me understanding. And I'm convinced 
He helps every believer who earnestly prays for wisdom and understanding. Uh, God wants us to know him. And the only way that can happen is if we connect with him and pray and ask him for help. So we have to pray. Uh, I would even encourage people when you sit down to do your Bible study, before you do anything else, just simply pray and say, Lord, I'm about to read your word. Uh, help me understand. doesn't have to be a long, you know, drawn out prayer. Lord, give me understanding. Give me wisdom. Convict me of my sin. Help me along my day. I need you. If we pray that earnestly, I'm convinced that God will help us understand and give us wisdom and give us knowledge of his word. So important. So very important. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that you and Jess have three kids. What advice would you have for parents to help cultivate a, a love for the Bible that will last a lifetime with their children at home? Yeah, so having children uh, is, is challenging when it comes to deep uh, theological study, uh, deep devotional study. You, you do have to get creative, even just as a parent. And, uh, and my wife and I have worked, we've had, you know, my oldest is 11 years old, so uh, count pregnancy. And we've spent 12 years, you know, trying to figure out um, how to cultivate disciplines at home. It's easier when you have a quiet house, but when you have lots of activity, it gets more challenging. So, you know, try to be creative in how you do that. But I think in terms of how to pass that on, you know, certainly the children learn from, from teaching, from didactic information. You know, you teach them something and they, they respond to it. But I think in terms of spiritual disciplines, they learn a lot from watching what you do. Um, if you're a, a parent who has a house full of kids and they never once see you pray or spend any time in the Bible, or if they never hear you talking about the Lord or talking about the things of God, um, then they're going to grow up and thinking, well, that's just something that I'm supposed to do, but my parents never did it. So we have to model for our children, first and foremost, uh, what that looks like. And so, um, you know, it's not that we want to put on a show for them, you know, but when I get up to do my devotions in the morning, uh, I'm sitting on the couch and I have a small house. And so my kids are walking past me as they're getting breakfast. And so they see me sitting there. They know when I'm praying they know when I'm reading my Bible. And again, it's not to you know, to be showing off to them, but it's putting on display what we're supposed to be doing. So I think your children will, will respond and reflect the things that we are doing ourselves. And then I think when it comes to talking to them, I mean, Deuteronomy 6 talks about or gives instruction for how to, to, to live this life along the way, you know, writing verses on the doorpost. Well, that's almost symbolic to say, let's talk about God any chance we get. So some of our training is direct instruction sitting down and teaching them some things, but a lot of it is conversations. And, you know, I was doing the dishes yesterday and my daughter said, Hey, daddy, I have a question about God. And so I stopped what I was doing. I turned around and that's a moment to be able to connect. And I think another thing as parents is that if we don't know the answer to a question, just tell your children, well, I don't know, let me find out for you. And then you can go to the scriptures together, or you can bring them through whatever process you go through. So I think again, uh, the, the relationships that you're going to have with your kids, and I think just immersing uh, your family in these disciplines and modeling these for your children. Uh, again, my children are not grown yet, so I'm trusting that the wisdom I've received from other people is going to take root as well. Um, but that's, that's what we're doing. I think that's what I've been taught to do, and that's what I've seen other believers do in their own home, is model for their families what it means to live a Christian life including Bible study and including prayer. Yeah, that's really helpful. What does hermeneutics mean, Nate? And why is it important for all Christians to know and not just theologians? Yeah, so hermeneutics is a really fancy word for um, what it means, the, the art and the science of interpreting the Bible. Um, so there is a, a methodology. And the reason I say art and science, and I've stolen that from somebody else, and this is a definition that's been floating around, uh, it is a science in that there are certain rules. Um, so we talked about that earlier, you know, context, understanding context, you know, what is the grammar of a sentence and the grammar of understanding words and their relationship. So there are rules to understanding what the Bible says and means, but there's also an art form to it as well. That when you read the Bible, you know, you are engaging in prayer, you're, you're meditating on the, on the scripture, you're, you're turning phrases over in your mind, and you're saying, Lord, what does this mean? And you're wrestling with God. And so you develop this language of, of asking questions of the text and asking questions of God and then receiving understanding and receiving illumination. 
and, and you know, writing down your thoughts and you read a verse a hundred times and the hundred and first time it'll make sense. You know, you probably experienced that yourself and you're like, Oh, that's what that means. You know, and it's this discovery. So that just takes time and practice. And so it's not just a rigid, here's all the rules. There's also a, a, an engagement of, of wrestling with God and wrestling with his word to understand uh, what it really means. And so many of these truths uh, are given to us uh, just by divine understanding through prayer, through meditation, through study. So, but really, again, to bring it back to a simple definition, it's just the the practice and the under the the art and the the science of interpreting what the Bible means, and that's yeah. every every Christian has to do that. Yeah, as someone that has to prepare to preach every week, which involves obviously lots of study, how do you separate and protect your own personal time with the Lord? <laughs> it's funny you asking that question because I was just talking to my wife about that this morning. Uh, it's it is hard. It's really hard because. Um, my vocation as, as a pastor involves disseminating not just the scriptures, but biblical truth, theology and church history and everything. So, um, you know, for me, it becomes all inclusive. You know, I mean, what I, a lot of times when I do my devotions, if I have a passage that I'm preaching on Sunday, that's really on my mind, sometimes I'll actually just set aside my plan and I'll go to that passage because I, I want to think through it more, um, but, you know, it is a struggle because um, in, in ministry, um, I'm trying to say this the right way. Um, I sometimes miss the days when I didn't have to prepare a sermon for Sunday in that I got to read and do devotional reading in whatever I wanted. There, there was there was no expectation. If I wanted to go and read, you know, Stephen Sharnock, The Existence and Attributes of God and take three months to do it, I could do that. Uh, now it's just different, you know, now there's, there's more responsibility, but, um, but that is also a great joy too. So uh, I think the challenge is really just trying to compartmentalize in your mind and in your heart. Okay. This time over here, this belongs to me and the Lord, this over here belongs to me and the church and trying to carve out those times. It, it is a little bit messy, but I try to reserve my mornings for that. And I also try to reserve my late nights for that. Um, and a lot of times, even just for me as a writer and as a teacher, um, I enjoy the, pro the process, like this book on the creeds that I'm writing. Uh, I'm excited about that because I want to learn. I want to grow as a Christian. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not writing the book because I've mastered these. I'm writing the book because I want to get better and help other people get better. So um, that's a long answer to a short question. But um, I think you, you have to just think about what is this time for? And make sure that you give the Lord the first fruits of that time and the best fruits of that time, which is challenging. But I think it's it's the right thing to do if we can discipline ourselves to do it. Yeah, we know that the Bible was not written in our language. So for those that cannot speak Greek and Hebrew, we rely on translators, but not all translations are the same. Give us a bit of a breakdown about what different types of translations we have and what are the most reliable. Yeah, so that's a huge uh, topic of translation and the, and the, um, the science and the, the theory of translation. Uh, but, you know, we understand that, you know, when you have a, another language, you're trying to find the most accurate translation of, of what was actually said. That's in any situation. So, the, but there really are two schools of thought when it comes to Bible translation. Some translations will go for a more essentially literal translation. So those will be like the, the, the King James, the New King James, the New American Standard, um, the English Standard Version, uh, even the, the Christian Standard Bible, which is a newer one. Those translations will really try to get after what's actually on the page, uh, literally. And you would say, well, well, yeah, that makes sense. Why wouldn't you do that? Well, the challenge is that with a language like Greek or even Hebrew, sometimes the word order is different. And sometimes the grammar is weird. And so uh, I read the New American Standard. It's, I think it's the most essentially literal translation. But sometimes the verses are clunky and the grammar is awkward. Um, and so when you go to sit down and read it as a book, as a document, it, it, you stumble over it sometimes because of the, the, the rigidity in translation. And so another school of thought will say, well, let, let's, let's not go verse for verse here, or word for word. Let's kind of go thought for thought. Let's, let's kind of open it up a little bit. And they'll take some leaps and really try to say, okay, what is this verse really trying to say? And they'll smooth out some of the grammar 
They'll take some interpretive leaps. Uh, the new uh, international version, the NIV does that. Um, the new living translation, NLT does that. They'll try to sort of smooth that out and the translators begin to make some decisions about what the, the verses mean and sort of expand that out. Those can be really helpful uh, because it does give you a sort of a broader view, smoother when you read it. But sometimes if you if the translators are, are thinking differently about a verse than, than maybe the rest of the church is thinking about, it, it might make some mistakes. They can bring in some narrative, which is a little bit dangerous. I think overall, you have to understand that translations, I think of them as tools in a tool belt. Each translation, each philosophy will do something different. You just have to know what you have. I think for personal Bible study, for us, for exegesis and study, for sermons, I use as little of a translation as I possibly can. And then I do the work of interpreting and even rendering some phrases. But if I'm just, you know, trying to study and sort of get a, a better sense, a broader sense, I think using a, a more um, thought for thought translation can be helpful. I think it can can provide a little bit of insight as long as you know that that's what that actually is. So yeah. use them like tools in a tool belt. That's what I say. You stopped at thought for thought. I was hoping to hear your uh, thoughts on paraphrase and message. Tell us about that. Now. Do I have <laughs> to? Do I have to? So uh, there are translations that are, they're really not translations. They're, they're, they're essentially commentary. Uh, the most famous is the message by Eugene Peterson. Uh, it's really not a translation. It's, it's his free, free thinking interpretation of a lot of the verses. Um, I, I think I think maybe on a devotional level, it could be helpful, um, but, but it's, it's not the word of God. And I think we have to know that. Uh, I don't fault him for doing that. I think that there's, you know, Christians have been interpreting and commenting on the Bible for, for centuries. But I think to say this is the word of God when it sounds so very different than what is actually written, I think that's a little bit dangerous sometimes or maybe just not helpful. Um, but, you know, I think if a Christian wants to read that and understands what they're reading, there could be value there. But I really I lean the other side. I really want to get as close to the text as possible to the original Greek and Hebrew. Um, I really want to know what what did God inspire that that's what's going to be helpful and instructive. And uh, that's really the revelation of God right there. So, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't read the message very often. <laughs> I know you love reading lots of Christian books. In fact, you've written some great books yourself, like we've spoken about. But what advice would you have about dividing time between reading the Bible and reading books about the Bible? Yeah, it's, I think it's an important question. Um, I think you have to start with the baseline has to be scripture. You know, you have to start with what is the word of God? And um, um, I, I, that's going to be what's going to sanctify you, what's going to help you, what's going to, tr to teach you and train you. Um, and so you have to begin there. So if you're the kind of person who has a very busy schedule and you only have a small window of time to read, uh, I would not try to waste that time on extraneous things. I would make sure that that time is purely for the word. And then if you can fit other things in, that's great. But here's, here's the trick to that. Uh, is that if I gave you a million dollars and I said, all right, I'm going to give you a million dollars a year. If you carve out an hour a day of time to read the Bible, and I'll give you $2 million. If you can carve out another hour to read whatever you want, you'd find a way you would always find a way you, you, you would move heaven and earth to make sure you had time. So in the end, study and reading is really all about priorities. So um, but I think that start with the word, make sure that you have a, an adequate feasting on the word first. And then with the abundance of that, then you can carve out time for, uh, for theology. I think every Christian should be engaged in some level of theological study, even if it's base level. And I think church history, I think history and biography is so helpful because that's the, that's the, the fingerprint of God on all Christians over all time. And that can be really helpful and encouraging for us. And so I enjoy biography. I'm starting to get into writing biography. I like biography. Um, but I think it's just been so helpful for me to know, okay, how did God interact with that person in that time in that way? That's really encouraging. So that can sometimes help even set on fire the desire to study even more. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're, the, uh, we're the substance of what we plan to do, you know. And if you, if you carve out the time, 
uh, it'll be it'll be there for you. Let me just give you a quick plug though. Reagan Rose has a ministry called Redeeming Productivity. Redeeming Productivity, and if your listeners aren't familiar with that, go look it up right now. Uh, Reagan is a he's a Christian. He's a, gra- a seminary graduate, but he's devoted his entire ministry to helping believers. Uh, be more efficient and carve out time for the right things, spiritual disciplines, healthy, healthy activity, work, play, family, everything. He's really uh, committed to helping Christians do what they're supposed to be doing. And his ministry is invaluable. So that'll help you for sure. Yeah. Go to his website after you, you click off of your website. <laughs> well, that's a great shout. We'll make sure that there's a link in the description below. So thanks very much for that, Nate. Um, Many people watching and listening to you right now will be familiar with the Bible in a year plan. What are the pros and cons with this? And also tell us about the seven year plan that you speak about in your book. Yeah. So I want to be clear that, you know, whatever plan a person uses, I think is, is good because, you know, the, the Lord never tells us how exactly to read the Bible every day. Um, but mo- a lot of Christians have been reading all the way through once in a year and they just keep on going over and over again. The drawback to that, however, is that if you're new to the Bible, and you're not familiar with the whole overarching story, or if you just don't have the time for study, if you are a busy scheduled person, then sometimes you can miss a lot. I think you do miss a lot. And you know, I've been, I've been sick with a cold for the last week. Uh, on days that you are sick with a cold and you can't even open your eyes, say you, say you sleep through your alarm and you're home sick from work and you can't even open the Bible, well, you miss a whole minor prophet that way. You know, so the danger is you'll, you'll miss a lot and you won't have the time to delve deep. There are some passages and some chapters and some whole books that are so incredibly deep. You can't read Romans in two days and call it good, you know? So there's limitations to that, even though it does expose you to the word um, I'm advocating for a little bit of a longer term approach. When I say seven year Bible plan, that sounds scary, uh, but it's really not that bad. Uh, The idea with that is, is that you set out a plan I, I, I did the, the New Testament in three years and the Old Testament in four years. So for three years, every single day, I would just pick a book of the Bible and I'd spend one month, every single day, one month in that one book. So first John, I just read all through first John every single day for a month. And I would just ask questions and study and read and think and ponder until I felt like I really had a good handle on what is first John teaching. Then I did that with Titus and first Timothy and all the way through longer books like the gospel of John, for example. I did that over the course of three months. I break it up into parts and you just immerse yourself. And I did that every single book for three years until I felt like, okay, I think I know what the new Testament teaches. I feel like I'm not a master of it at all, but I'm comfortable with what, with what's here. And then I kind of broaden that for the old Testament as well. And at the end of seven years, I mean, you really feel like you walk away with just a, a greater sense of what's actually here, what the Bible says and what it doesn't say. That's important too. When someone says something to, oh, the Bible says this, well, if you've read it and studied it and you can say, well, that's, that's not what the Bible says at all. That's nowhere in scripture. That's yeah. important too. Um, so I think a longer term approach, if seven years scares you, start with a couple of years, three years in the New Testament, or say you do a two-year plan or whatever you decide to do. I mean, frankly, the years are immaterial. If you're a believer and, uh, and you plan on uh, remaining a believer for your whole life, that's a joke because you will. Uh, but if you're a believer, you're going to have your whole lifetime to go back to the word over and over again. So why not take half a decade and just study really deep and see what the Lord does in that study, um, knowing that there's no wrong way to do that plan. It's just what can you do that's consistent, that's going to be helpful for your learning style, and how can you just devote as much time and energy into understanding what god has written that's the that's the point of the whole thing yeah um the years are immaterial yeah nate this has been so helpful i always love catching up with you before we wrap up do you have any closing thoughts well i always have closing thoughts david i mean every time you know no i um i'm just thankful i'm thankful for your ministry that your ministry is focused on getting people into the scriptures Uh, that's sorely needed so thank you for for your work in that and i feel like in this way let me just do a little plug here how to eat your Bible. Um, that's the reason I wrote this book is because I, ha- I have the same heart, I believe that you do, that we just want people to get into the Bible. And I think if that were to happen, if a whole generation of Christians were to just focus on getting into the scriptures and rightly understanding the scriptures, I think it would have massive effect. I mean, we're talking revival, should the Lord grant it. So there's really nothing else that's more important than that. 
And that again becomes the baseline of everything else in the Christian life. So I'm just thankful that the Lord allows me to write books like this. And I'm thankful that he's raised up men like you to have ministries like yours to help people understand the text of scripture. So thank you to you and praise God for his faithfulness. Thank you, Nate. And and thanks again. You you gave us very kind permission to use your teaching series on Galatians, which, by the way, is one of my favorites on, oh, on the whole of our God. channel. So thank you so much for that. Nate, how can people follow you on social media? You, you're a great follow on Twitter. I know you're on there. Tell us about what handles and where, where people can find you. Yeah, so I'm on uh, I'm on Twitter. That's probably my most active account. You can just at Nate Pickowitz. Um, I'm also on Facebook. I have a public Facebook page. It's just Nate Pickowitz. Uh, I have other accounts everywhere, just in case everything shuts down and you have to move around. So I have an account on, on uh, I think I'm on Gab, I'm on Instagram, I'm on I'm all over the place. But Twitter and Facebook is mostly where I live. So they can follow me on there and they'll see me. Okay, well, I'm going to go and find all of those links. I think you're on MeWe as well. I'll make sure that they're all listed on the description, uh, in the description below. Nate, thanks again. Also, there's going to be a link to your book, obviously, in the description below as well. Thanks so much for your time. Always enjoy it, Nate. Thank you, David.